Welcome architecture newbies! Today I'll be talking about the different type of architecture models you can make and some of the tools you'll need in the process. Roll the intro! So before you get started, have you thought about what the scale of your model is going to be because that's a really important place to start. The scale of your model will determine how much material you'll need and basically how long the model will take. It will also determine how much detail your model should be in. So if it's a larger scale and a bigger model, you're going to want to show it in more detail. Also what stage is this model at? Is it a final model? So it might be in a lot more detail. Or is it just an early stage model, so it might just be a simple maquette to test out different forms? The type of model you make for a final project can be drastically different from one that you'd make early on. It's important to photograph your work along the way so that you can keep it as a record for your portfolio. I'm going to be talking about a combination of different models, some that are going to be handmade and some that will require more computer use to create. When I started my bachelor's degree, the first year was almost entirely hand-drawn and handmade objects and we didn't actually get into computer work until the second year. So I'm gonna talk about that stuff first. What you're gonna need is a ruler. This is a scale ruler, but you're also gonna need another ruler, potentially even another ruler. You know, you can never have too many rulers. I also have a one meter long ruler, very good for cutting big pieces of card. I also have my mini travel rulers. This one's my scale ruler, and what I did was I, I taped on scale people so that I would be able to tell a lot easier what the scale of the model was. Ohio, it's, home from work we go. it's a bit extra, but this was really helpful if I wanted to see if my model looked to scale, because if you're building something in CAD first, you can check the measurements against your sections, elevations, and plans, but if you're just creating something from a model straight away, sometimes you're not sure if the scale is appropriate, besides looking at general guidelines and, you know, ceiling heights and that kind of thing. So sometimes having a little scale person there can be really useful. You can also get completely built little ones, which are great for models in the final stages, but they can be expensive. So if you can buy them in bulk and share them with your friends, then that's a much more affordable way. A useful tip is if you're ever using a thin ruler like this to draw with ink pens, then what you can do is you can tape the bottom of the ruler and this will help raise the ruler off the paper just a little bit so that the ink doesn't bleed underneath the ruler, which can be a problem. So yes, you've got your rulers, as many of them as you need. Um, some rulers will also have a, a edge like this, which can be a lot better when you're starting to use scalpels and that kind of thing. But you can also want to have tracing paper. You can buy it in rolls and you can also buy it in sheets depending on what you need it for. If it's gonna be presentation work, then the sheets are sometimes a lot clearer than the rolled up work. So you just check what you need and buy it and use it for purpose so you don't waste too much money. Another thing you're gonna need with handmade bottles besides pens, pencils, and rulers are cutting boards. This one is, yeah, it's been through a lot. <laughs> I also have an A2 and an A3 cutting board, but this is my, I guess, travel size cutting board. Yeah, look, there was a piece of tape on it, and um, I just sliced right through it a bunch of times. There's some glue, there's some paint, it can get a little messy. And if you're tracing on top of something, another good tip is to tape down the edges so that you can use that more effectively without it sliding around, especially if you're tracing over something for a model, or you know, just use it straight onto a, a piece of foam board, card, paper, whatever you're using. Another thing you'll need is glue. This one's great. Uh, it's an all-purpose adhesive, and it's Yoohoo, but there are plenty of other different types. I also have a little packet of super glue, depending on what the material requires. Different materials, different glues. Make sure you buy one that will work for what you need. I also have my set of scalpels. Um, oh man, I had an amazing scalpel that I bought in Japan, but I let a friend borrow it and then never got it back, which was kind of a bummer. Well, yeah, there's all different types of scalpels. This one's more of a box cutter, but depending on the purpose, it can be good. These ones I haven't opened yet. Then there's these ones, but I consider these a lot scarier than the slide out scalpels because you have to actually replace the blade and they're quite sharp and they make me really nervous. You have to like pop it out from here 
So if it's sharp and likely to cut you, it's not great when you're tired. I would also say as a tip, try not to make models with scalpels past 3 a.m. if you can. I think 3, 4 a.m. was always my limit for handling scalpels appropriately, and it's still a couple hours before daylight, and then you kind of set into a new rhythm anyway. So just know your body, be careful, and never use scalpels on a cutting board on your lap, because people have actually died that way. So don't do it. I have had some near misses, some close calls, and some actual scalpel wounds. Um, my comment about not cutting on your lap is also from personal experience. I have cut myself on my leg and I was just really tired and I didn't want to lean over my desk anymore. But really, please be careful. You do have a major artery in your leg and it's just not safe. But I have taken a small chunk out of my finger. I have sliced onto my hand. So just make sure you're really careful. And if you can use one of those rollers that slopes up on the side and make sure you're actually using the side that's a higher edge to cut with your scalpel, then that will be a lot safer. So when I say I put my blood, sweat, and tears into becoming an architect, I mean it. I put my blood, sweat, and tears. So many tears. <laughs> but yeah, just be careful, that's all. So depending on the size of your model, you might want some bigger tools. You can get a toolkit like this from Ikea, which is great. It's also you know very useful for DIY and your own personal stuff. But hopefully the university that you're going to also has a workshop and they will have a lot of these tools. But in case you're doing anything in your dorm room or studio space, then this is excellent. And the hammer is also great if you're still doing pinups at your university because having to do a lot of push pins in the wall with your thumb can get really painful after a while. So having a little hammer is excellent. You might annoy people though, but it's worth it. <laughs> the other thing that you're gonna want for site visits or even just measuring tools and materials on a larger scale is a tape measure. This one's great, it's about seven and a half meters. You can hold it in place or you can also lock it, which is really useful. But even with that, at a certain point, it will start to bend, especially if you're doing it vertically. So another option that you can use is a disto. And this is a distance laser. So you can either measure it from here or from here. And then the laser pointer will point to the other wall or ceiling, depending on what you're measuring. This is great if you have to measure much bigger distances and you have to do a lot of measurements. It can really speed up time. It will record a couple of them at one time before you need to note them down. So definitely worthwhile. It's also got a leveler on there. This was only about 20 pounds. So worth an investment, especially if you're working in practice and you need to go on site visits regularly. As for model making, less useful unless you're doing surveying before you create the model, then yeah. So those are the basics of what you'll need for handmade models besides the actual materials, which would be, you know, at least two millimeter gray or white card or foam boards, great, depending on what you're creating. I actually used to make trees from scratch when I was working at Toyoito in Tokyo, and that was actually really fascinating. And if you're using foam board, it can be really great if you're using needles as well, because you can glue the needles to your objects and then just push them into the foam board and it'll help keep them vertical. An example of a card-based model that I made in my bachelor's degree is this one. Oh, it's, it's a little bit dusty. <laughs> this one of the cloisters of the Canterbury Cathedral. This was a really interesting project. We were supposed to create an installation on the cathedral that wasn't touching it. I created this glass pathway that went into this glass ventilated box. And basically the cloisters were used by monks back in the day. And it was a space for walking around silently for uh, interpretation and thought. So I thought this box, the project named Sound of Silence, uh, was great to look out at the cloisters and have the silence of the space rather than the sort of volume of tourists. So I did a little bit of pen work on this, measured it. I mean, the glue has not stood the test of time. As you can see, it's come out a bit yellow over time. And one thing you can do, especially with curving a uh, card, is you slice the opposite end of it, and then this will help bend it without the card itself starting to rip. So that can be really great. Yep, so that was an interesting project. So this is another model that I created, and it was meant to be a private detective's office and home. This is what it looks like from this side. 
and I really wanted to show it as a section model as well. So I flipped it around and then you can see the timber and the floorboards. This was back in my bachelor's degree, so I do know a lot more about structure now and what a floor plate would actually entail. But at this time in my life, it was a really good effort. And on this side, you could see that there's a timber structure with steel nodes connecting them in a tessellated form. And then another aspect that I did was I had a giant window here, which was meant to be a magnifying glass and it faced towards Canterbury Cathedral and it like zoomed it in. I thought that was a fun aspect of the private detective's office. And then in the home at the top, I had the bathroom hidden behind a bookshelf. So it was I like, I like designing hidden spaces. <laughs> Moving on to computer work. So past the first year of your bachelor's degree, you're gonna start using the computer more often and gonna start to create a very different type of model that's made a lot less with your hands and a lot more with machinery. So there's a lot of different types of these and you can use a bunch of different softwares to create them or make them in the process. You can use a laser cutter, a 3D printer, a milling machine, and several others. You can even start to use the metal workshop and vacuum formers. There's plenty of tools. See what your university has to offer and really test it out and have fun with it because this is your time to experiment with model making and other educational things. An example of a project I did with a laser cutter was this site model. I did cut all the floor plates and base out of laser cut model as well in the larger scale model, but this one was much smaller. I used two different types of wood, so you can either use MDF or plywood or acrylic as well, so I wanted to show the river area. I also created the context buildings around, so each of these had three pieces and it was basically a giant puzzle trying to find all of these and then glue them each together and then put them at the right place on site. For laser cut models, you can either etch or cut, and that can be a great way to show sort of road lines, context, as well as cutting out pieces to put on your model. So when you're model making, it can take a lot of time. So my advice is work on things that require a lot more brain power during the day. And since there's a lot of repetition in model making, you can do that later in the evening when you're more tired. And one of the ways that I stayed awake in the process was listening to upbeat music, including Christmas music, any time of the year, on repeat, on three hour playlists. I listened to Disney music, and I also had movies playing in the background if it was something I'd seen before. So that can be really helpful just to keep your spirits up in the really, really long hours and all-nighters. Um, if you can avoid pulling all-nighters, then go for it, but I am not one to talk because I pulled countless all-nighters in my bachelor's and master's degree. So just be careful and be safe and try and have some fun with it. A really good tip if you need to make a context model, which can be milled out later, is rather than spend days building a context model in SketchUp or Revit, if you're a student, you can use a program called CAD Mapper and you can get a kilometer of topography and buildings for free. You can thank me later. An entire model of Tel Aviv and that was really useful for getting uh, photo montages and imagery of my site model in context. An example of a project I did using a 3D printer was this model. So I designed it in Revit and exported it so that I could print it 3D. There were a few complications and I had to end up printing it a few times because these void spaces printed solid. Sometimes it's just a process of testing things. And this, and generally 3D printing can be a little bit expensive, but hopefully your university will make it a little bit cheaper for you. And it's a really worthwhile process if you can test things out. This one, I ended up showing the solar shading and vertical light wells, as well as ramps. And the more delicate your model is, the more difficult it's going to be to print. So if I printed this any smaller, or if these ramps were any thinner, they probably wouldn't have printed and they actually didn't in some of my earlier tests. So this one's great. You can use them in a bunch of different colors depending on what you're trying to show. And I was fairly pleased with how this turned out. I have a bunch of other models that I've made over the years and I've kept my favorites. So I can make another video, which is basically just show and tell of what I've created from my bachelor's degree till now, which is, you know, 
over 10 years. So <laughs> it's great to keep and just see how uh, my skills have evolved over a decade. As I mentioned previously, you're gonna wanna photograph your models throughout the entire process, especially when they're finished. You can take a large sheet of white paper or a white sheet or just a white backdrop, whatever you have available, because you might wanna Photoshop that out in the background. And if it's a solid color, it's gonna be a lot easier. One of the things I did after my bachelor's degree and master's degree was I created a special portfolio just for them. And it was a compilation of all the projects that I did. And these were great to take to interviews or even if I'm just showing my work to a friend. Besides projects, I also wanted to add in special sections for extra sketching and model work that I've done that I wanted to highlight. So these are some examples of photographs that I've done of my work in the past and the models in development and the pieces that went with them. This was a winery and vineyard in Hamburg and was actually a very large scale model and I probably wouldn't make one that big again on purpose. And I tried to use pieces of foam for the base and then ended up carving it out with a cheese grater. And it basically made my flat look like it had snowed, just white fluff everywhere. And it was a nightmare. So my advice, don't do that. <laughs> also, in my bachelor's degree, I saw someone using insulation as a model making material. Don't do that either. Don't do that. So yeah, these were some pictures. And then I even went above and beyond for this one and designed a wine label. So yeah, I have a page for models in my portfolio. This was the private detective's office that I showed you earlier. And some more, some smaller maquette models, which were great just for testing out different forms and scales. Um, I also have this model, which is the small house in Tokyo by Toyo Ito. And this was a really good project to work on. This one was scale one to 50. I do have it. I do actually have it like right over there, but the point of having pictures is that you don't need to have the model to hand when you're showing it to people because it's a lot more difficult to carry around. This page has pictures of the Cloisters model as well as another one testing out the maquette styles and also transparent elements using translucent sheets. One of my favorite things about the Hamburg model that I worked on for the winery and vineyard was that I took pieces of foam board and I took small pieces of plastic that represented steel frames, like an I-beam, and then I put them within the foam board beneath a piece of white card to show the structure, which I thought was really interesting. One thing I also love to do with models is make them section models so that they come apart so they look like a bigger piece at the beginning and then are something much more at the end. When you're working on models, you can also do a lot of sketching in the process. So I would recommend if you can keep your sketches in your portfolio as well. When you're talking to employers, they do want to see a little bit more of your creative side um, and not necessarily just your architecture work. So it can be a great thing to show. Sorry, this thing's like in my way. <laughs> So yeah, I just had a couple pages devoted to just my sketches, which was great because I can also just look at back on them now and it brings back all the mems. I forgot to mention that you can also use hot wire cutters and pieces of foam. One of my favorite ways to make models quickly. Uh, you can also use pieces of bossel wood to create site context, depending on what you're trying to show, but it can be a lot more expensive. When you get into the real woods, it can get quite pricey. I also designed a project in my bachelor's degree, which was a, a jewelry archive. And it was one of the models that I mentioned does split in half so that you can see it from a sectional point of view. So there's some pictures here. Honestly, it's one of my favorite models that I've ever created. And I think the pictures turned out really well. I used my DSLR Canon camera and I even tested different types of concrete. Uh, building myself and if you're ever working with concrete know to protect your hands because It can be very painful and dangerous if it gets on your skin So be careful and if you're working on your portfolio even simple sketches showing your overall idea or design development can be really helpful not just for your tutors, but also for employers, so these aren't excellent, but it was a useful way for me to just annotate my work and see how it improved. When you're doing a section model, you can use that to create your actual section when you're making a final killer image or Photoshopping it. So that can be really useful if you wanna Photoshop uh, it into the wider context of the existing site. And it can also be useful to inform your final design and whatever type of section you might be creating at the end. 
These were just a few of my projects, a few of my models, uh, tips on model making for your bachelor's and master's degree, from hand-based model making to more computer-based software with 3D printing, millwork, and laser cutting. So I hope you found this video helpful, and if you like this content, please like and subscribe. Subscribing is free and it really helps. Be kind to each other, be kind to yourself, and have a great day. And enjoy model making and be very careful with those scalpels. Have fun! Thank you.